The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, Chapter 24. Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner, Authors. The capital of the Great Republic was a new world to a country-bred Washington Hawkins. St. Louis was a great city, but its afloating population did not hail from great distances, and so it had the general family aspect of a permanent population. But Washington gathered its people from the four winds of heaven, and so the manners, the faces, and the fashions there presented a variety that was infinite. Washington had never been in society in St. Louis, and he knew nothing of the ways of its wealthier citizens. It had never inspected one of their dwellings. Consequently, everything in the nature of modern fashion and grandeur was a new and wonderful revelation to him. Washington is an interesting city to any of us. It seems to become more and more interesting the oftener we visit it. Perhaps the reader has never been there. Very well. You arrive either at night, rather too late to do anything or see anything until morning, or you arrive so early in the morning that you consider it best to go to your hotel and sleep an hour or two while the sun the Atlantic. You cannot well arrive at a pleasant intermediate hour because the railroad corporations that keeps the keys of the only door that leads into the town or out of it take care of that. You arrive in tolerably good spirits because it is only 38 miles from Baltimore to the capital. And so you have only been insulted three times, provided you're not in a sleeping car. The average is higher there. Once when you renewed your ticket after stopping over in Baltimore. Once when you were about to enter the lady's car without knowing it was the lady's car. And once when you asked the conductor at what hour you would reach Washington. You are assailed by a long rank of hackmen who shake their whips in your face as you step out upon the sidewalk. You enter what they regard as a carriage in the capital and you wonder why they do not take it out of service and put it in a museum. We have few enough antiquities, and it is little to our credit that we make scarcely any effort to preserve the few we have. You reach your hotel presently, and here let us draw the curtain of charity, because, of course, you have gone to the wrong one. (laughs) You being a stranger, how could you do otherwise? There are 118 bad hotels, and only one good one. The most renowned and popular hotel uh, of them all is perhaps the worst one known to history. It is winter and night when you arrive. It was snowing. When you reached the hotel, it was sleeting. When you went to bed, it was raining. And during the night, it froze hard, and the wind blew some chimneys down. When you got up in the morning, it was foggy. When you finished your breakfast at 10 o'clock and went out, the sunshine was brilliant and the weather balmy and delicious and the mud and slush deep and all pervading. You would like the climate when you get used to it. You naturally wish to view the city, so you take an umbrella, an overcoat, a fan, and go forth. The prominent features you soon locate and get familiar with. First, You glimpse the ornamental upper works of a long, snowy palace projecting above a grove of trees and a tall, graceful white dome with a statue on it surmounting the palace and pleasantly contrasting with the background of the blue sky. That building is the capital. Gossip will tell you that by the original estimates, it was to cost $12 million and that the government did come within $21,200,000 of building it for that sum. Sketches of Japanese Manners and Customs by J. M. W. Silver Love of Flowers One of the many traits of the refinement which characterizes all classes of Japanese in their passion for flowers, which is singularly rich and varied nature of the flora of the country, aided by the magnificent climate, enables them to cultivate with great success. Every Japanese has some knowledge of the art of gardening, and, however humble a house may be, it generally has a potted flower or a dwarf tree about it, 
or in the absence of that, a flowering branch of peach or cherry placed in water. Regular professors teach the art of dwarfing, training, and grafting trees and plants, and of laying out miniature landscapes into which artificial mountains and valleys are introduced, and very frequently lakes studded with lily pushin fern-covered islands, around with gold and silver fish, may be seen darting about, and if the sun is hot, taking refuge under curious Japanese bridges, or the broad leaves of the lotus, which usually covers a portion of the surface. The only thing out of proportion, probably, in the details of the miniature landscape. The sitting apartments in Japanese houses are generally situated at the sides or back, and either open upon flower beds, grounds of the above description, or some kind of enclosure shaded by peach or pear trees, trained trellis fashion overhead, or by cedars, with one solitary bough twisting fantastically over the ground, showing, in its unnatural contortions, the skill of the artist. The other branches have been lopped off, or stunted to facilitate the growth and training of this one. Gardens for the sale of dwarf trees and flowers are also very common. Some are the perfect bijou, as the rule the varied collection of flowers planted in colored china pots are arranged with very agreeable effect in tiers of shelves around the sides and on the stands about the gardens. Many of the dwarf trees, especially the maples, have great variety of foliage, the result of constant grafting. To such an extent is this practiced that it is rare to find pure botanical spe specimens in a Japanese garden. Plants are sometimes cultivated for their berries as well as for their variegated fo foliage. One very beautiful specimen, producing at the same time bright scarlet and yellow berries, is believed by many to have been obtained from the cuttings of an exquisite shrub, which is said to be the principal ornament of the regions of the Kema, or Japanese heaven. Even the fern family undergoes a strange metamorphosis at the hands of Japanese gardeners. Some of the fronds are artificially variegated, and others, on reaching maturity, have a curious crumpled appearance. Again, the roots of certain small species are frequently twisted into curious devices and hung up in grottos or shady corners. The effect of these, when the roots are partly concealed by the fresh young fronds, is very pretty. Nearly every fortnight a fresh flower comes into season and is in great demand for the time, heavy prices being readily paid for the fine specimens. The poorer classes commonly buy flowers from men who gain their livelihood by hawking them about the streets. They buy them not only to gratify their tastes, but as offerings to their lars or their panes, patron camas, or to decorate the tombs of departed relatives, a religious ceremony which is strictly observed. The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton Number 9 Newland Archer prided himself on his knowledge of Italian art. His boyhood had been saturated with Ruskin, and he had read all the latest books, John Addington Simmons, Vernon Lee's Euphorian, the essays of P. G. Hamerton, and a wonderful new volume called The Renaissance by Walter Pater. He talked easily of Botticelli and spoke of Fra Angelico with a faint condescension. But these pictures bewild, bewildered him, for they were like nothing he, had, he was accustomed to look at, and therefore able to see, when he travel, traveled in Italy, and perhaps also his powers of observation were impaired by the oddness of finding himself in this strange empty house, where apparently no one expected him. He was sorry he had not told May Wellen of Countess Olenska's request, and a little disturbed by the thought that his betrothed might come in to see her cousin. What would she think if she found him sitting there with an air of intimacy implied by the waiting alone in the dusk of a lady's fireside? But since he had come, he meant to wait, and he sank into a chair and stretched his feet to the logs. It was odd to have summoned him in that way and then forgotten him, 
but Archer felt more curious than mortified. The atmosphere of the room was so different from any he had ever breathed that self-consciousness vanished in the sense of adventure. He had been before in drawing rooms hung with red damask, with pictures of Italian school. What struck him was the way in which Medora Manson's shabby hired house, with its blighted background of pompous grass and Roger statuettes, had, by a turn of the hand and the skillful use of a few properties, been transformed into something intimate, foreign, subtly suggestive of old romantic scenes and sentiments. He tried to analyze the trick, to find a clue to it in the way the chairs and tables were grouped, in fact that only two Jacqueminot roses, of which nobody ever bought less than a dozen, had been placed in a slender vase at his elbow. elbow and in the vague, pervading perfume that was not what one would put on a handkerchief's, but rather like the scent of some far-off bazaar, a smell made up of Turkish coffee, ambergris, and dry roses. His mind wandered away to the question of what May's drawing-room would look like. He knew that Mr. Wellen was behaving very handsomely, already had his eyes on a newly built house in East 29th Street. The neighborhood was thought remote, and the house was built in a ghastly greenish-yellow stone that the younger architects were beginning to employ as a protest against the brownstone, of which the uniform hue coated New York like a chocolate, cold chocolate sauce. But the plan plumbing was perfect. Archer would have liked to travel, to put off the housing question. But though the Wellingtons approved of an extended European honeymoon, and perhaps even winter in Egypt, they were firm as to the need of a house for the returning couple. The young man felt that his fate was sealed. For the rest of his life, he would go up every evening between the cast iron railings of that greenish yellow doorstep and pass through a Pompanian vestibule into a hall with wainscoting of varnished yellow wood. But beyond that, his imagination could not travel. He knew the drawing room above had a bay window, but he could not fancy how May would deal with it. She submitted cheerfully to the purple satin and yellow tuftings of the Welling drawing room, to its sham buhl tables and gilt vitrines full of modern sex. He saw no reason to suppose that she would want anything different in her own house and his only comfort was to reflect that she would probably let him arrange his library as he pleased, which would be, of course, with sincere East-like furniture and the plain new bookcases without glass doors.